But I just think the alternative is so fascinating. You know what I'm saying? Like, and I, one of the things that always strikes me about it is, like, it's voluntary. You know what I mean? Like, all y'all choose to get up, and I'm not even, I'm not trying to make fun of everything. I, like I said, I didn't even see it uh, this time. But it's just funny, like, you chose to do this, and it always gets me thinking, what if it worked differently? Like, what if it wasn't voluntary? What if it was the kind of thing where we're all going to be in here at 10 p.m. and we're going to lock the doors and you all got to be here, you know what I mean? And like you come do some slam poetry and you lead us in worship and you right here, like, okay, you're like, you're a dinosaur. Ready? Cue music. Now dance. You know what I'm saying? Like, how great would that be? And what if, no, like, but like, what if the stakes were high? What if it wasn't just you get to say no if you want to, but like if you don't do what we've just told you to do, we're going to mock you like all day. What if we're going to take this chain and like chain you up? Like that would be weird, right? Like that, actually, it's kind of creepy. No one's down with that. You know what I mean? Like no one wants to be changed. No one wants to be in bondage. Like we as a people value our freedom. We as a people are going to fight for our freedom, right? Like that's just kind of who we are. That's just, that's just kind of what we do. I got to be honest with y'all, I'm, I'm a little bit, I don't know if worried is the right word. There is a bit of concern for me because I think, I think, I think we might be trying to accomplish something that's close to impossible this morning. Let me explain what I mean. Day four is like the fun day. Like that's, the, I love the rhythm of move. Day four is like we got extended rec later on and it's the day when you're looking forward to just sort of cutting loose and having a good time and all that's fine and good. And yet we've got some interesting material to cover this morning and I got no problem with it. I love the material that we're covering but the only way I know to like lovingly lead you through it is to ask you to think this morning. Kind of hard. Like, like when I think about what we have to cover today, my goal this morning is not so much to like capture your heart or make you laugh. I want to exercise your mind muscles because we're going to put a decision in front of you today. We're going to put a decision before you that's kind of one of those turning point, line in the sand kind of moments. And, and like honestly, I'm not being dramatic. What you decide one way or another will change, like will change everything about your life. And so we figure it would be beneficial for us to help you for your sake to think it through, to, to really wrestle with what it is we're presenting to you today. See, we're talking today about God, of course, and we're talking today about obedience. And therein lies part of the issue because the Bible makes a big deal about obedience. John, in this letter, makes a big deal about obedience. If you've read through 1 John, it doesn't take long. If you've read it from cover to cover, like even if you can't read all that well, you're probably going to pick up on, on some core ideas. And one of the core ideas in this letter is that to love God is to obey Him. That, that's pretty clearly something that John wants to communicate to us. Speaking of John, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and take them out. Let's read a little bit of the Word together this morning. We're in 1 John chapter 5. That's the portion of the letter that we're going to be studying together for a little bit this morning. And we're looking at chapter 5, and we're just looking at verses 1 through 5. So you've looked at a part of this for, you know, the, uh, the verse for today, the, the, what you, the exercise you guys just did. Let's take another read through it. So I'm going to give you a second to turn there or to tune in your device there, however you're accessing the word. 1 John 5, 1 through 5. A lot of words in here, and so I want you to see them as we read them. Here's what John writes. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. This is how we know that we love the children of God, by loving God and carrying out his commands. In fact, this is love for God, to keep his commands. And his commands are not burdensome, for everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Maybe you've noticed something about this letter. As John works his way through the letter, it's not like he just continues to bring up new ideas that he hasn't talked about before. It's more like he has a couple of core ideas and he keeps circling back through. It's more like same old ideas looking at him in new ways. Maybe you've noticed this. Maybe when I read that text, you think like, yeah, we've kind of, we've kind of heard that already. 
It's okay to think that. And when you think that, I think that you should hear John saying, yeah, well, you tend to forget. What John does, at least so far as I can tell, in this part of the letter is he combines these three tests that he's been talking about throughout the letter. Remember, the whole thing is like, how do you know if you're in? How do you know if you belong to the Lord and you're walking in the light and you're following Jesus? How do you know if you're a Christian? And he's talked about this obedience and he's talked about the love and he's talked about the belief and he walks through them in different ways. Walks through all of them in chapter two. Then in chapter three, he kind of revisits obedience and love. Chapter four, he doubles down on belief and love, and he re-brings them all back together. And I think part of the point of this right here, the section we just read, is that these things are not separate. They're one and the same. It's sort of like if you, it's like if you describe a rose, you're gonna talk about the petals, and you're gonna talk about the color, and you're gonna talk about the smell, and if you don't talk about all of them, you're not really capturing the rose. If, I, if I'm gonna describe my wife to you, I'm gonna talk about her godliness, and I'm gonna talk about her beauty, and I'm gonna talk about her work ethic, and like if I leave any of those out, then I haven't described her to you. And so what John is doing is he's holding up life with God, and there are some of these key elements, and we've been trying to pull them out one day at a time. We dabbled in love at the beginning of the week and we're gonna come back to it tomorrow. We talked for a bit about the, uh, the idea of belief and then today we're gonna to talk about obedience. We gotta talk about obedience. We must talk about obedience. And I say must because, man, it's not exactly a popular theme. Of all the four letter words that could get you into trouble in certain circles, in our culture today, I'm not sure there's a four letter word that wins you as few friends as this word, O-B-E-Y, obey. I don't know if there's a concept that's more universally despised than this. And maybe that is a little bit overstated. I don't know if obedience is universally despised. We're fine with it if you're talking about little children or dogs. You know what I'm saying? Like if you Google obey, those are most of the links that you'll get. Some stuff about kids, some stuff about dogs, and some stuff about how obedience is a dangerous idea. We're not exactly comfortable with this. Suggestion, cool. Advice, fine. Command, I'm not as sure. So step into the light. Okay, okay, I'll step into the light. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Believe, trust in Jesus. Okay, okay, I'll trust in Jesus. Obey, hold up. Like I, da- I like, to, I like to, to dare people to do silly things. I dare you to do some obedience experiments of your own this week, okay? Just go around and start barking out orders. <laughs> Just start telling people what to do. Hey, somebody give me some coffee. Somebody rub my feet, you know, heal, sit, fetch. Like, just start barking out orders. Now, if you do this, I'm not responsible for the results, all right? Like, if you end up with some bruises, that's not on me. And if you end the week, like, more single than when you started, that's not on me. Like, you're choosing to do this. But, but give it a shot. You know, I don't know that it's going to go real well. Again, suggestion, fine. Advice, a listen. Command, we're not so good with that. Because no one tells us what to do. Obey your desires and nothing else. That's what they will tell you. Obey your thirst, trust your heart, follow your intuition. Do what you know is right and don't let anybody else tell you otherwise. Think for yourself and go with what you know is best. And especially, especially in a religious context, obedience is perceived as a dangerous thing. And and I understand why. We all understand why. There have been a lot of corrupt men through the ages who have called people to do things in the name of God that those people would later go on to seriously regret. It is easy to abuse religion. It is easy to abuse the name of God. That's not what I mean. I am not talking about you doing whatever I say. I'm talking about you reading this book with clear eyes and a submitted heart and never knowingly acting against what it teaches, what God reveals, what God says. Don't listen to me. Don't listen to us. Listen to him. Because if you say you love God, but you don't do what he says, you don't really love him. If you say you trust God, but you don't obey, then you don't really trust him. Like it really is that simple. It's hard though, isn't it? Because today is all about dropping the chains that hold us in bondage and obeying what God says. And that's not necessarily easy. And for some of you, this chain probably represents a relationship. I remember just last summer, I was talking to a young girl, super bright, intelligent, engaging girl. She came up to me after I'd preached a message about the importance of repenting and walking away from our sin. And she said, I'm in a relationship with a guy, and like, 
how do I know it's not okay for us to be sleeping together? And we talked a little bit about what the Bible says, and I just could tell she kind of wasn't satisfied. And I'm like, what else is going on here? Like, and then in the course of the conversation, she went ahead and acknowledged, like, it's not like we're thinking about it. It's like we're, we're actively doing this, and, and I don't want to stop. And, and, we just, and, and I kind of dug a little bit deep with her in, 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 in an appropriate way, of course, but like, what's going on? And she kind of was helping me understand that for her, it wasn't even so much about the pleasure. It was about like the way in which this relationship had become for her something of a security blanket. It felt like if she were to lose him, then, then her life really couldn't continue in a way that would provide happiness. And if she were to step away from doing this with him, then she'd probably lose him. Maybe that's where you're at. I don't know. Like maybe for you, it's a different sort of sin habit. Maybe it's, maybe it's pornography, or maybe it's alcohol, or maybe it's pills, or maybe it's lying, or maybe it's slander. I mean, the list goes on and on, and I'm not interested in trying to make sure all of you feel uncomfortable. I'll trust the Holy Spirit to put into your minds what it is that needs to be in your minds if something needs to be there. I think for a lot of you, it's, it's probably not so much that you're doing something that you should stop. You've stopped doing those things. For you, it's more like there's a good thing that you should be doing. There's something that God's calling you to, but you've been ignoring him. And it may be super concrete. It may be there's a person in your life, maybe a sibling, maybe a friend, maybe an enemy, maybe a teacher, I don't know, somebody, maybe a neighbor, maybe a coworker, that God has been calling you to love in a certain way and you've been resisting. Or for some of you, especially those of you who are moving toward the end of your years, but honestly, even all of you, even those of you who are freshmen, sophomores, maybe it's like God has been laying out for you and putting on your heart a vision for your future that you don't really like. Maybe God is calling you to, uh, you know, I don't know, maybe God is calling you into a particular career. He's calling you to be a doctor for him. And you're like, no, like, I don't want to do that, or I'd rather do that for me. Maybe God's calling you to be a minister. Maybe God's calling you to be a pastor. He's saying, I want you to go into ministry. I remember last year, I know two, two, three years ago, actually, I was at a, a move event, and I was talking to a young guy. His name was Adam, good kid, a faithful kid, really sharp kid. And I wasn't trying to pressure him into doing anything, but he came up and would talk to me about, I feel like maybe God's calling me to ministry. And I would just listen and ask questions, and it seemed to me like God was. And he was wrestling with this because if he did this, it would mean less money, and it would mean less prestige, and it would mean that his parents weren't pleased. And I actually got a semi-angry email from his mother the next week because she thought I was trying to encourage him to do ministry. And I remember just processing this with him. And uh, listen, I don't I don't know. I don't know what God wanted him to do or if God really cared about his career one way or another. Maybe God was saying whatever. I don't know, but my sense was God was calling him, him, not everybody, him, and he wasn't listening. Like, I don't know. Maybe, maybe that's what this represents for you, a future that you want, but you know is different than what God wants for you. Like, I Again, at the end of the day, the chain represents different things for all of us, but for all of us, it represents the question of whether obedience is worth it, whether obedience is a good idea. Man, if the Bible wants to make a big deal about obedience, it's gonna have a hard time staying popular, isn't it? Even with us. Yet on this point, I don't think the Bible intends to bend. John is not just out on a limb here. He's expressing a theme of this book from beginning to end. To love God is to obey him. And it kind of makes sense, really. Like, think about if you were learning piano, right? And so you have this piano teacher, and they're instructing you, and they're saying, okay, you sit down, and you put your hands like this. What if you're like, actually, I want to be the first person who plays with my hands backwards? Or like, what if you're like, I want to be, I want to play piano with my fists. Like, they're going to look at you like, do you want to learn the piano or not? Because if you want to learn the piano, then you got to listen to me. Or let's raise the stakes on this a little bit. What if you're skydiving? How many of you have ever been skydiving? How many of you want to go skydiving? Like you want to jump out of a plane? Yeah, a lot of you. Wow. Let's say you're going skydiving. How many of you think they're crazy who want to go skydiving? <laughs> yeah, I saw it on some of your faces. Let's say you're going skydiving. And so you're up there, you know, in the aircraft, and you're about to jump out. And they're like, okay, one more time, let me go through it with you. And maybe you've done it before tandem, but this is your first time to go alone. And they're like, when you get out there, then I give you the signal, and you know it's time to pull the string. Don't pull the red one, pull the green one. That's the one that will release your parachute, and then you can kind of fly through the air and be safe. And what if you're like, hold on a second. I forgot to tell you it's loud, right? The wind is blowing. I forgot to tell you, I don't really like the color green, but I love the color red. Can I pull this one? <laughs> What, they're gonna look at you like, get, stay in the plane. You are not safe to jump out of this thing because you don't understand, like I'm telling you what to do to make sure that you live. 
this is not a matter of preference. This is a matter of survival. We understand in certain contexts that there's just a time to look at someone who knows more than we do and to do what it is they're going to tell us to do. And, and I got to, again, like I know this is heavy. I know this is, this is thick, like this is deep at a soul level. But if you're going to let God take you where he wants you to go, you got to give up control. And what if that's actually a great deal? What if that's actually the best possible offer? What if your intuition can't be trusted? What if your heart is sour? What if you crave ultimately destructive things? And what if he really is strong enough and loving enough and caring enough to be trusted? What if God's best for you is the best for you? It reminds me of a time when my daughter was just a little girl. She was a little 18-month-old girl. And she used to, when she was little, she would have these, uh, like, cloth diapers. And so she had this little pink cover. So she was just this tiny little thing with this huge pink booty, you know. And she just always run around with this bouncing pink booty. And I remember this one time, I'm sitting in a chair, and I'm looking at my daughter, Claire. And she's probably about, I don't know, like, I'm in the chair here. And she's probably about 8, 10 feet away from me. And she's looking at a light socket. And she's standing there, and I can just watch her, and her back's to me, and I see her, she just kind of raises up her hand. And I said, Claire, and she put her hand down. And then she, but she doesn't move, right? So she stands there for a minute, and then she raises up her hand again, and I said, Claire, and she put her hand down. Happened about three times. After the third time, she turned around, and she started waddling toward me, all happy because she had obeyed. And she got, like, right up close to me. So I'm, like, a foot away from her. The wall's way over there. And she just stops, and she looks at me. And this is what she does. <laughs> just, just, I'm just going to see, you know, and I think sometimes, like, that's, that's what we do with God. Like, yeah, God, like, I'm obeying, except there's a part of me that still wonders. And in this scenario, it's not hard to understand that I am demanding that she do something because I know what is best and I care enough to tell her what is best. What if that's the situation that we're in? What if obedience to God really is the only reliable path to lasting happiness? What if God is not setting us up to fail, but putting us in the best position to win? And speaking of which, let me draw your attention to something else that was in the text. I don't know if you noticed it. Did you hear that word overcome mentioned multiple times? And then there's that word victory. In our language, it's two different words. In the original, same word. The verb is nikao, the noun is nike. You recognize the word because it's where we get Nike. It's, it's, it's a word that in the Greek refers to this, this goddess of victory, this idea of winning or being victorious, to conquer, to show yourself superior. And I think what John is saying is to obey is to win. Not just in the future, but now, like to obey God is already to have won this fight that we're all stuck in, whether we want to be stuck in it or not. Like culture may confuse you, peer pressure may tempt you, the demonic may threaten you, Satan himself may try to sway your intentions, but if you've already become a person for whom obedience to God is just what you do, you've won. It's not hard to sweat and bleed if you know that victory is sure. And to be very clear, here's the irony we're considering. Sometimes we start to feel like obedience itself is the burden. We may feel like this idea of having God tell me what to do doesn't seem very desirable to me. I don't like what I'm living. I don't like the chains I'm in, but I don't want those chains either. And so instead we decide, like I'm just gonna do what I wanna do or I'm just gonna listen to somebody else. And it feels good for a while, like we feel loose and we tell ourselves we've dropped the chains, but the reality is we haven't dropped anything. We've just moved them around. It's, it's a fake victory, it's a false high, it's a temporary happiness, because sure, I feel loose for a while, but it's only a matter of time when I recognize that I'm still in bondage. At the end of the day, what we have to recognize is that the only way out is to let go and look up. And the decision before you today really can be simplified. You're either gonna obey God or you're gonna obey someone else. One of these paths is just another set of chains. And listen, my job is not to like take you to the point of making a decision. My job is not to answer the question for you. My job is just to raise the question and then you think about it and decide what you're gonna do. Like we believe 
that obedience to God's word is the most reliable path to lasting happiness. Do you?